Oh, not at all, Edgar. I love children. Welcome to Deadline Morton Grove. I'm your host, Shel Marcus. And if the uh, sounds you just heard and the picture of the old-time radio brought back some memories, I think you're really going to enjoy tonight's show because we're going to really delve into the history of radio and what made us laugh, cry, maybe even get excited. It's going to be a most fascinating half hour, and we have an individual who's going to bring it right up to date with us in just a few minutes, somebody who lives right here in Morton Grove. So don't go away. We'll be back in one moment. Well, do you, does your memory go back to the 30s and the 40s and the 50s in terms of radio? Or are you one of those modern people that just watches television all the time and don't even know what a radio is all about, except for a sporting event or maybe some kind of conversational show? Well, I have a guest in the studio tonight who's gone back and started out as a hobby and has now turned it into an avocation, which is now a vocation, I should say, in old-time radio, Chuck Shaden. Chuck, good evening. Shell, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. Uh, I don't think many people realize that you've lived in Morton Grove for a number of years. How many years have you lived here in Morton Grove? A little better than 31 years in Morton Grove. Unbelievable. Almost. I mean, I came when I was nine years old. And uh, been yeah. ever since, That's huh? right. I'm 39 and holding. <laughs> 39 and holding. That's, <laughs> that's good enough for Jack Benny. That's right. That's right. Good enough <laughs> that's for Jack Benny. That's good enough Benny. for me, right? Absolutely. But I think most people uh -huh. probably are familiar with your voice and maybe for the first mm -hmm. time have seen you up close because of all your shows that you have uh, on radio, the various shows. I mean, I go back, uh, way back to, uh, I guess, the 70s uh, when you used to have a studio out in Evanston, I believe. And that goes back that's right. to... right. We started in 1970 on right? a little station in Evanston with... Uh, it was a daytime 1,000-watt station, and we were on for, we started out three hours on a Saturday afternoon playing the old-time radio shows, and uh, it's been a long time since 1970 when we started that, and we're still going strong, and uh, we've moved a little bit away from a 1,000-watt daytimer. We're on WBBM, right. which is a 50,000-watt radio station in Chicago, and WNIB, which is a high-powered FM station in Chicago. So we're able to share, which that's the best thing. That's, that's why I'm doing all of this stuff, because I have the collection of radio shows, and I want to share it with uh, people. How did you get started? I mean, uh, have you always been a fan of old-time radio, or is it something that, that initiated a certain... No, I grew up with old-time radio. You know, I was a kid in the 1940s, and laying on the floor in front of that Zenith console radio there with the flickering green eye, and right. I just loved listening to the radio. And when TV came in, I thought, well, I'm going to turn on the TV and now see all those people I've been listening to and in some cases I was disappointed because they didn't look the way they were supposed to look you know I mean we used our imagination and a lot of people didn't look the way I thought they should look and that kind of spoiled it and then a lot of radio people didn't make the transition to TV and TV had its own group of true entertainers but it was such a fascinating thing to be here when television came on the scene. I mean, now you've got pictures in your home, even though it was a, you know, maybe a seven inch screen or a 10 inch screen. I, I remember mm -hmm. when television first came in, I think uh, my, uh, my father at the time had a small screen with a tremendous bubble. You remember those bubbles? Oh yeah, Where the magnifying used, right. thing over and, it. Yeah. And I remember watching some of those early shows, uh, I guess Howdy Doody and uh, from children's yeah. point of view. Uh, but it's a different, it was a different concept. Uh, you mentioned about imagination. I think one of the greatest benefits mm -hmm. of radio was the fact that it really let your mind wander and develop your own sense of, uh, of what the person or what the area was all mm -hmm. about. And I thought that we might have lo lost a little of that in terms of Well, technology. radio uh, had as its prime ingredient your imagination. So you always had to participate in radio. You could not listen to those old radio shows without participating because you had to provide the picture. We used to listen to the shows. We had to decorate the sets and costume the actors. And if that black sedan was speeding off into the distance, we decided if it was a Chevy or a Ford or a Hutmobile or whatever it was going to be. So you had to participate. It was, it was a participatory sport. Television, uh, no, it's a spectator sport. You just sit and watch, and you watch what someone else has decided, the imagination. Their imagination is done, because they put the pictures out there for you. But see, we were a real important part of radio. And that, of course, is why, for those of us who grew up with radio and remember it so well, 
we still have those vivid pictures in our mind of all the scenes that we saw. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we heard the, the opening segue and the segment of uh, the radio with the Lone Ranger mm -hmm. series. I remember the Lone Ranger series. I mean, I, I believe it used to be on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's right. And it came out of Detroit. WXYZ in Detroit. XYZ. Yeah. All right. I didn't remember yeah. that. And, and Brace Beamer, I think I was discussing with you before we sat down, was the name I remember. There were a number of Lone Rangers, I guess, uh, besides Well, Brace most Beamer. notably before Brace Beamer was a man by the name of Earl Grazier. And he had been the Lone Ranger for quite a few years, but he was killed in an automobile accident. I didn't know that. And when I was a kid and found out that the Lone Ranger had gotten killed in an automobile accident, it was really a puzzlement because I thought, First of all, the Lone Ranger is not supposed to get killed. And secondly, what the heck was he doing in a car? You know, I mean, he's got that great horse silver. That's right. But the actor was killed in an auto accident. And Brace Beamer had been an announcer on the program, a narrator. Mm -hmm. And after a suitable time, about a week, uh, the scriptwriters changed the script around so that the Lone Ranger was seriously ill, too ill, in fact, to speak. Really? And uh, for a week, we only heard his heavy breathing while Tan Tonto nursed him back to health. And then, of course, it became Brace Beamer took over the role of the Lone Ranger, and he stayed with it till the very end. And it started, uh, this year is the 60th anniversary of the Lone Ranger, as a matter of fact. It started in 1933, on January 31st of 1933, really? so it's 60 years ago. It went off the air as far as original programming was concerned in 1955, so it was a 22-year run. And it has been on somewhere ever since. In fact, if you tune into my programs, you'll hear The Lone Ranger on a regular basis. Now, your shows are on, on Saturday, I know, um, uh, on the FM station. What station yeah, is that? WNIB, which 91 is 97.1. 97 yeah, every Saturday from 1 to 5. Right, and the BBM show is That's, on? That's uh, seven nights a week, Saturday and Sunday evenings from 8 until 10. And then uh, for the night owls, Monday through Friday for an hour beginning at midnight. So if any so of the uh, viewing audience of uh, wants to hear some of that wonderful oh, sure. nostalgia, they can pick it up uh, at those particular times. And it's a great uh, series. I, I said to you uh, mm -hmm. again before we sat down, I've painted many a room and done a lot <laughs> of outdoor work right. with the radio close by because, again, it doesn't need you to watch anything. That's correct. Yeah. You can do uh, those kinds of activities and still uh, be uh, entertained and uh, be moved by, by, uh, by the voice and by music. Now, when you were a kid listening to the radio mm -hmm. and doing your homework, didn't at one time or another your parents say to you, how can you do your homework while you're listening to the radio? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you have said to your kids, how can you do your homework while you're watching television? Yeah, probably. The kids can always do it. But in my case, now I can say I was doing research. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. We'll continue with uh, more with regard to Old Time Radio and Chuck Shaden uh, after this uh, brief announcement. Please stay tuned. I think you'll find the rest of the show fascinating. A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> His faithful Indian companion Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now. We're through us, mm -hmm. and it's playing us. Ah, sometimes it feels like the music is playing us, and we're, we're the instrument. And, and, and when that happens, I mean, all the money in the world can No better feeling. That's right. A big pain in somebody's uh, uh, butt, you know. She's just a difficult uh, yeah. person. She's got a... There's an, she's a girl from Michigan, except that there's no girl from Michigan left there anymore. I found time with her to be exasperating and difficult and challenging uh, because she never gives an inch. She never wants... That was interesting. That particular uh, segment we just heard about the shadow mm -hmm. uh, was probably one of the most um, listened to and probably, I don't know what the lifespan of that particular show was, but the shadow was one of the 
when you talk about old-time radio and talk about mystery shows, The Shadow was one of them. It was a show that everyone remembers. And it was a show, it was a character, really, that, was, that, that came out of uh, pulp magazines, Street hmm. and Smith publications, The Shadow. And they never successfully transferred it to movies or to TV because... The shadow, he had the ability to cloud men's minds. Right. Lamont Cranston went to the Orient, he learned the hypnotic powers to cloud men's minds. Well, he, has, he hypnotized it, you know, he went boom, and, uh, and then you couldn't see him. He became invisible. And of course, the device they used on radio is they used a filter microphone. And whenever the shadow spoke, he spoke through a, a, a somewhat of a right. filter microphone. Not as uh, uh, sharp a filter as, the, uh, as you would use for a telephone conversation. But nonetheless, he would be in the room and the, and the crooks couldn't see him and he could overpower the crooks. And we, you know, we saw that in our minds listening to the radio. You can read about it and get the picture, but to see that, how, how could it work yeah, in yeah. movies, you know, or on the TV screen? Now, was that an afternoon? That was an Sunday. evening show? Sunday. The night. shadow was on Sunday afternoons. Sunday. It was like 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. It was at 5 o'clock in New York, and in New York they call them the 5 o'clock shadow, you know, which was a... <laughs> <Is> that, <laughs> you that didn't come weird. from that, though. That, uh, no, 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 that okay. 5 o'clock shadow came out of uh, Gillette, uh, Gillette Blue Blades okay, or something okay, like that, okay. you know. Avoid 5 o'clock shadow. Right. Uh, something, Gem Blades, I think it was. Whatever, but... But the shadow was on for many, many years on Sunday afternoons. An unlikely time for a mystery program, but Sunday afternoons had a few mysteries. They had the True Detective Mysteries and Nick Carter, Master Detective. Wasn't, when was Gangbusters on? Was that a weeknight? Or it was a weeknight program, okay. yeah. But, there, I mean, the weekends, was Sunday considered prime time, like we consider prime time in terms of television during well, the weeknights? Well, now, TV, Sunday night is the most watched television night of all, right. I understand. But uh, Sunday night and radio was, well, it was okay. It was a, it was a good night, but... The afternoon usually was almost considered a throwaway. There wouldn't be many people on there. But you know who changed the face of Sunday radio? It was Jack Benny. I was just going to say, Jack Benny... He was at 6 o'clock in Chicago. Which was 7 o'clock New in York East, time. Yeah. Did, did he used to uh, broadcast from California? From or California. From, which is about, what, 5 o'clock there? Well, he did two shows, you see. Before they went to tape, they used to do always a second show, as they said, for the West Coast. You know, the, the majority of the population of the country is in the Midwest, uh, is in the central and eastern time zones. So they would do one show that would hit that whole half of the country at the same time. So it was 7 o'clock, Jack Benny, for example, 7 o'clock in New York, 6 o'clock in Chicago, mm -hmm. and the whole central time zone. Then that would be 4 o'clock in Hollywood. Right. So they'd do a show at 4 o'clock. And then they'd come back and do another show Hollywood time at seven o'clock. Fascinating. It's it's really and they had to get everything. They had to, the audiences were the same. New audience to get a new audience because there'd be a couple refresh, hours in right, between. Right. And in the case of Jack Benny, uh, they would go over that program and they would say, well, now this got a good laugh. This didn't get a very good laugh. They'd make some refinements. So actually, the West Coast audience got a maybe a, a better show than the rest of the country. You know, you brought with uh, a clip of a Jack Benny show. Oh, yeah. Uh, and in fact, you brought with a, a picture of, of, of one of those uh, standard kinds of uh, publicity shots. Why don't we just take a brief moment just to listen to what the classic of Jack Benny comedy is on radio? Okay. Okay? Listen closely. Oh, Senor Irish, Senor Irish. What is it? Uh, before you leave, I would like you to meet my little six year old son, Tomas. Oh, hello, Tomas. Uh, Tomas, he is learning to be a magician. He does a wonderful act on the stage with his sister. Really? So you're a magician, eh, Tomas? Say. Do you have an act? Say. With your sister? Say. What is your sister's name? So. Sue? Say. Well, what do you do in your act? Saw. What do you saw? So. Sue? Now, wait a minute. Somebody put you up to this. Who was it? Me. You? See. 
Who are you? Sorry. Sorry. Hi, I'm John Paxson. My teammates and I are working toward fulfilling our dream for another championship season. But there are far more important wishes that need to be fulfilled, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Northern Illinois is making them come true. Make-A-Wish has fulfilled the wishes of more than 800 children with life-threatening illnesses. These kids have had the rare experience of seeing their dreams come true. Please support our efforts to make even more wishes a reality. Learn how you can be part of Make-A-Wish. Call 312-943-8956. Ah, uh, you know, Edgar, it's touching to see your affection for the little nipper. It strikes a tender chord in my heart. Oh, thank you, Bill. You know, I thought you didn't like children. Oh, not at all, Edgar. I love children. <laughs> I can remember when, with my own little unsteady legs, I toddled from room to room. <laughs> when was that? Last night? Or... Quiet, warm wood, or I'll winter you down to a coat hanger. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, Charles, is it true your father was a gate leg table? <laughs> if it is, your father was under it, or. <laughs> That's also interesting. Char <laughs> Charlie McCarthy. The Woodpecker's pinup boy, I, according I, to WCC. You know what always amazed me about that, and I've read so much about it, was the fact, if you think about it, this is not a live person. This is one person, Edgar Bergen, who is speaking as a ventriloquist right. on radio. I mean, the audience is sitting there and seeing that there are not two people speaking. It's just one person who's doing it. And yet the entire world was just... in engulfed with this kind of creativity. Listening audiences didn't want to believe that, the, that it was Edgar Bergen doing both voices. Uh, I mean, it was part of the novelty when he was first introduced on Rudy Valley's radio show mm -hmm. as a ventriloquist. But the listening audience always felt that Charlie was a real person. Now you go to a radio studio and you watch the show being performed and you see Edgar Bergen with this dummy up there and you know he's a ventriloquist, but Charlie was so real that radio, or rather, radio audiences, people who came to the studio, thought that he was he had a, a midget up there or something like that. Really? And they really believed him. But Bergen was an absolute master of timing, and he could ad lib within his own two characters that he was doing. Of course, he created Mortimer Snurd. He was very creative. Well. I think most yeah. a lot of people I talk to sometimes say, "Well, he wasn't a good ventriloquist because you could see his but mouth." But he didn't mode. care. He was just very creative. That's right. That's I mean, right. did he write all his material? Or he, he started out writing everything. Then after a while, he got a little bit of help from a couple of other writers. But uh, mostly, he was doing it all, and his timing was was impeccable. And that segment with he and uh, W.C. Fields, oh, Charlie McCarthy. Oh, that was always a feud going on there, a so-called feud, you know. And that was almost similar to the feud between Fred Allen and Jack Benny? Yeah. But actually, W.C. Fields, in a kind of didn't like kids or animals. Or <laughs> <laughs> right. You're right. Yeah. But uh, uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen, of course, that was a, that was a broadcast feud. And really, in real life, I guess, they were very good friends. Mm -hmm. Almost like Charles Barkley and Michael Jordan, a basketball <laughs> I fan. Guess so. I guess good so. Good friends, but when yeah. they get on the court, they're... Well, they were having uh, their yeah, thing. They were having yeah. their thing. You know, radio was so wonderful. We used our imagination. And, you know, for, a lot of, for the kids today, there were a few programs for kids but mostly they're watching reruns of nighttime situation comedies, where when we were kids listening to the radio, and it's the way it was in the 1940s, you had programs specifically for the younger audience. You had Captain Midnight and, or Little Orphan Annie, you had Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy, Tom Mix, Superman, uh, Dick Tracy, all those shows were just after school, we'd rush home from school, you know, and get on that floor in front of the radio. And Great advertising ven venues for those uh, shows. A lot of advertising oh, was created. Sold, sold a lot of cereal. I've been listening lately to some Superman broadcasts sponsored by Kellogg's Pep, the super delicious cereal. And they hardly ever say anything at all about the cereal. 
but they say send in the box top and get your sundial uh, wristwatch sure. or send in the buy the package of cereal and get these little pep pins out of there with the comic strip uh, buttons on them and all that sort well, of Captain thing. Midnight was a perfect example Oval of Ovaltine Ovaltine and the secret it's decoders and the shake up mugs that. I wish I had I wish I had my uh, <laughs> they're worth decoder. a lot of money now I know, you know Shell you can see secret decoders and shake up mugs and orphan Annie badges and things like that you can see Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. You can visit Jack Benny's vault at the Museum of Broadcast Communications. I'm well, very much involved in this. That's right. I'm glad you brought that up yeah. because that is really a, a fascinating place to really relive and see uh, radio history come right before your eyes. Absolutely. And they've done a wonderful job there. I've been down there myself uh, a number of times, and, and it's a great place to bring the children. It's a great place uh, when you go to Chicago, and it's free. Absolutely free. It's, it's at the Chicago Cultural Center. Right, which is it's over on Michigan Avenue, and it's between Randolph and Washington. You enter on the Washington Street side, and there you are in yesterday. Oh, it's it's fair, <laughs> and I would certainly urge our viewing audience if they would like to really take their children or their grandchildren, Absolutely. come down there. And you broadcast down there on Saturday. Every right? Saturday afternoon at one o'clock for four hours, we do our "Those Were the Days" program from WNIB. So, we have a nice studio, and anybody who comes in is welcome to come in. So our in neighbors in Morton Grove can see a fellow neighbor in Morton Grove. Right, right? That's, that's right. That's right. That's terrific. You know, one of the things I saw down there, which uh, we talked about. Uh, is uh, another classic com uh, comedian and actually a husband and wife, Fim Regee and Molly. Oh, yeah. And you actually have the closet uh, and you actually have the original scripts, I guess, that they The family donated. of Jim Jordan, who played Fibber McGee, right. donated to our museum all the bound volumes of all of their scripts from the Fibber McGee and Molly show. And when we got that, we uh, asked our fans of Fibber McGee through my radio shows if they would like to contribute to help us build a Fibber McGee's closet exhibit. And so they send in their funds, uh, the money, and uh, we built a real nice exhibit. And when you go down to the museum, you can open up casually, carefully, right. cautiously, right. open up the door and experience the same experience that it people is. had when they, Fibber and Molly, or someone who visited them would open up their hall closet, which was always overstuffed Typical. And had more junk in it. Now, we all had a Fibber McGee's closet. Right. And you, you brought a clip of, of the radio show that shows that. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, let's, let's listen I to know. the opening of the Fibber McGee closet from Old Time Radio. Well, 9 o'clock is swell, Foggy. I appreciate this a lot. Good. I'll go home right now and start setting it up. I'll just duck out the side door here if you don't. No, no, no. Oh, that's that's not the side door. That's the hall. No, that's not the That, that is really interesting. Too. Everybody had a closet uh, like that, didn't they? I still have a closet like that. In fact, I have a whole room like that. You can't go into that room. There's too you many You know, things. young people who never heard Fibber McGee and Molly or ever heard the shows, when I talk about Fibber McGee's closet, they, their eyes open wide and they say, you know, my mother has been saying my room looks like Fibber McGee's closet, but I don't even know what she means. But I know what she means. The closet, her room is yeah. junky, jumpy or junky. But that's the way it was. You know, I, I wish that. we had an hour and a half of time to talk <laughs> about old time radio because we didn't get into uh, the Bickersons, which was a classic radio no. show. We didn't talk about the children's shows like uh, Let's Pretend, mm. uh, those kinds of shows. Um, the Cinnamon Bear, which is a oh, classic yeah. kind yeah. of series. Um, we will have to have you back again, Chuck, uh, <laughs> okay. for another segment sometime later on because this has been fascinating. Now, I wish I did have more time, but we don't. I just want to say this has been a most enjoyable after, afternoon, half hour, I should say, mm -hmm. in the evening, with Chuck Shaden, a fellow resident of Morton Grove and Old Time Radio. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have a few closing comments in just one second. Please stay tuned. And that reminds me, I need some money for a new dress. I can't give you any money this week. That's what you said last week. Well, I kept my word, didn't I? <laughs> Anyway, you don't need a new dress. Yes, I do. I've been wearing this old rag for two years, and I'm ashamed to go out on the street. Stay home. <laughs> Wherever I go, the women whisper behind my back, there goes Bickerson's wife. Look how she's dressed. For heaven's sake, look how I'm dressed, and I'm Bickerson. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? It means I'm barely making enough to keep body and soul together, and we don't have any extra money for fancy clothes. No, but there's always plenty for your precious bourbon. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't start that again. I never spend a penny on the stuff. Not much. The whole house is full of empty bottles. Where'd they come from if you didn't buy them? I never bought an empty bottle in my life. <laughs> well, 
Why don't you get rid of them? Uh, I gotta get out of here, Blanche. It's getting late. Answer me, John. Why are you so attached to a lot of dead bourbon bottles? I was with them when they passed away. <laughs> As a YFU volunteer, you can help families in your community become part of Youth for Understanding International Exchange. My wife came home one evening and said, gee, would you like to host a foreign exchange student? And I said, well, yeah. It's not what we've given to the kids, but what they've given to us. YFU did a great job in helping us to select the perfect student. Osla got off the plane absolutely exhausted, looking dear and vulnerable and warm, and he was my son. You never say goodbye to him because once you have an exchange student and they're in your life and in your family, they're yours forever. They're, that's your kid. Volunteer now to be part of the world of YFU. Call 1-800-ARE-YOU-READY. I just can't emphasize enough how great it is, how, how great it's been. Again, this has been the most swift half hour I've ever spent <laughs> in, in uh, television, to be honest with you, on Old Time Radio. It's, I want to thank you again, Chuck Shaden, from thank Old you. Time Radio, uh, a historian. Uh, you are expert personified. Really appreciate you being here, and I uh, want to invite everybody, uh, especially the people to take their children and grandchildren down to the Museum of Broadcast Communications mm -hmm. at the Chicago Cultural Center, Center Michigan and Washington open every day I understand every day and free admission mm, absolutely yeah so we had to build this museum because I have no more room in my Morton Grove home for all the tapes that we've collected That's over terrific. the years and they can actually <laughs> see you broadcast in the <laughs> afternoon right on Saturdays correct from 1 to 5 right. well thank you again you're welcome it's terrific. don't touch that dial don't touch that dial That's right <laughs> let me just leave uh, my audience with a few comments about some upcoming events that's going on in the Morton Grove area the Morton Grove Chamber of Commerce will have their annual golf outing on August 18th. And for more information, you can contact Kerry LeBeau, the Executive Director, at 965-0330. And don't forget that the Centennial Commission is still selling those Centennial tickets, $100 apiece, with your chance to win $50,000. That's right, folks, $50,000. And if you don't win the top prize, they're going to give out other dollar prizes up to $95,000 in total. So for $100, you have a chance. Contact Nick Marino at 967-5500. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening. This is your host, Shell Marcus, for Dateline Morton Grove, saying good night. Hope it's a pleasant evening for you.